love but just you Love but just you As much as I want to You gotta go with the flow Something that I don't know But I know I can't love but just you Yeah Zach Goodman How's it going? Hey Nick, how are you doing? Good uh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so excited to, uh, to hang out It's been so long since uh, It's been a while, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. The the last time I saw you was when you came and you you had to get the base. I think it was a yeah. base, right? That you had at the apartment. That thing has been at so many people's houses now. So I gave <laughs> it to you for a while. Like I don't know for a long time, right? L- long you time it. it was here. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then I lent it to my friend Robbie, who's um about to become a flight attendant. And if it goes well, oh, wow. I'm gonna get to fly for free. Amazing. Me, like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that so I can go some more places. Um, and then Robbie was like moving and he gave it to my friend, uh, Will, who has this cool studio um, in like on the on the east side. It's super cool. He has like this huge outdoor garden on the rooftop and it's, yeah. it's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. That's, it's so <laughs> funny how that how that how that base travels around. <laughs> yeah, it's like the, the sisterhood of the traveling base. <laughs> So, um, so I thought a cool place to start would, uh, would be to just kind of maybe ask you about, um, kind of how you got into music. Um, and then, uh, and then maybe at some point we could transition into, uh, how we, how we met. I remember we were texting the other day, you, you, uh, you mentioned that and I was like, oh, that is, I totally forgot, but that, that's, I think a cool story. Uh, I think how. Yeah. Okay. We can get into that later. But I like. Yeah, how long yeah. have I known you for though? How long have I known you? Oh man. Um. I I think we met in in 2010 because I know we started playing together a- after like our initial uh like you auditioned me for a band. Um. But after that, in 2011, we started playing together uh in uh the blue that blues band, uh, oh. the Southside Players. So I was gonna I say think, the same thing. I was like twenty one. Are we the same age? Uh, I'm thirty. I'm gonna be thirty six this month. So I think we're yeah, pretty close. yeah, we're the exact same age. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, so yeah, I want to say like twenty ten or twenty eleven, something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, you auditioned me for uh, a band you were playing in at the time, the radio. Right. Yeah. I just spoke to um the guitar player named Eric recently. Y- yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a nice guy. He's still he's yeah. doing pretty well. He's still like on Long Island in the same area, basically. Oh, really? Um, yeah, but he's a church like organist, also. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, he's yeah he's super talented. Yeah, I I think I follow him on. Uh, we're we're like connected on social media, and and every now and then I see him post some really awesome, uh, like little musical pieces he's playing on the piano or something. Take two. We're back. <laughs> take take two. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> But but no, I think this is good. We we could uh, this will be a funny little moment. I'll have like a yeah. I'll like edit it in such a way. Um, I'm not technologically but, advanced. Yeah. No, this is this is great, man. Um. So so we were talk. So I was saying, yeah, I've seen uh, every now and then I see some really awesome little like you know pieces he posts of him playing piano on uh, on Instagram or Facebook or something. Uh, oh yeah, he'll like transcribe these like jazz solos and stuff. It's yeah, it's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, unfortunately, I never got to play with him in that band. Uh, um, but yeah, it was cool to it was cool to c- connect with those guys. Have you talked to anybody else from that? Just know? him. I reached out to that guy Rick, who is like the right. father of the singer, and he was so cool. He used to play with Wilson Pickett in the nineteen sixties, yeah. and uh, they were a bit of a that family had a lot of um, energy. I don't know <laughs> just how to describe yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But- it was good to, you know, but you like, you hang out with some people, you learn some things and then you move on sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And, whereas, and I'm still in touch with you, but I'm not really in touch with them. So yeah, no, I was just going to say, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> grateful because we met through, through that opportunity and that project. And, and then we went on to play in a couple different projects together, which is so cool. Yeah. Um, but, but before I'm getting all hyped up. So before we get into all that stuff, okay. um, what was your like how how did you get into music? I mean, you play 
so many instruments very well. And, you know, I would just love to just for, you know, I have a lot, a lot of my students listen to the podcast. So okay. uh, of all different, of all different ages. So some of them, you know, are really young, but, but most are like teenagers or like early kind of college musicians. And uh, okay. what, what was your kind of like, how did you get to where you are today? So to speak, you know, I was always like really into music since I'm like a little kid, uh, three, four, I always wanted to play piano and eventually uh, this like childhood piano of my mother's ended up in our house, this huge grand, like baby grand. And everywhere I'd go, I'd want to play uh, keyboard. And I also was obsessed with Billy Joel. I had his uh, greatest hits number three, which is not super popular, actually. Uh, okay. It's got, yeah, it's more mediocre. He didn't, he started having less hits as like, you know, the 80s went on, uh, the 90s, really. And, um, but I was obsessed. And it had some great songs on it. And uh, from there, uh, let's see, around 2001, he put out, Billy Joel put out a Millennium concert album and it had all his hits for years. And we're both from Long Island. Billy Joel was like, yep. you know, in yep. our blood. And um, I was obsessed and I would like, I have like a, a kid's harmonica and I used to play along with, oh, I had my recorder from elementary school, which I still have. Wow. So that would be like, when we were like, you know, I was like seven or something. I still have it. It has like uh, the label on the back from from the, you know, my chorus teacher and what room I was in. And so I would try to play on the recorder along with like the Billy Joel record. And um, yeah, and that was a, a lot of it. Like, I just yeah, you know, yeah. love music. I started picking up all these instruments. Um, it's probably around middle school. And I love talking about myself. So here we go. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. This is what we want. This is what I want. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So uh, in middle school, I picked up bass and guitar. They basically, I was playing bass in the jazz band on a keyboard and I wasn't even great at that. But this teacher wow. was like, "You in sixth grade, you really should get a, you know, get a bass. You can actually play bass. And I did. And that was still probably a little over my head, but it's where I grew to love all these, you know, different rhythms and types of music and, you know, like get, got into some funky stuff. And as time went on um, in like, into like eighth grade, ninth grade, I was kind of really getting great at guitar and bass. And uh, I could do kind of different things like play harmonica at the same time. And I just kind of had different tastes than a lot of the kids in school. Um, but yeah. And, yeah. Okay. Around the age of 18, a friend of mine, and I, we used to go play at little um, restaurants together in Long Island. And awesome. he he would book the stuff. He was kind of like into the business side of it. And he was like two years younger. His name's Brett Cohan. And eventually we played a, a bunch of gigs one summer. And the next year he was kind of busy. And he booked me by myself at this like piano bar sort of thing called Off Key Tiki in Patchogue. And yeah. I ended up working there for like a year. And while I was there, I met this guy who does dueling pianos and yeah, it was like, they, they paid him like four or five times what I was getting. And he, he didn't even play because it was raining out. They hired me to provide a sound system. And I was like a hundred bucks. Oh my gosh. At the time, <laughs> you know, and, uh, the next thing, you know, I went from like a hundred bucks a night to like, you know, three times that, um, yeah. working for that guy in, in Fort Jeff and, Around that same time, I uh, was working at School of Rock on Long Island in the same yeah. area in Port Jeff. And that was like, okay, um, teaching's not always for me, but I actually got to like really open up my ears to more like rock and roll, like, you know, 80s rock, 90s rock, Guns N' Roses, got really into like Aerosmith there. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. It was kind of good for me in a sense, because I was more like a 60s pop guy. 70s sort of singer songwriter uh early rock and roll and yeah it expanded me a little bit and i've just kind of been doing that ever since uh it just kind of grew a lot from there and i i'm not on long island anymore really and i don't perform there as much and but it's good like yeah it's right yeah getting your it's like your roots you know getting your start yep. there and and it, and it allowed you to go on and, and do I mean, there's, there's so many places uh, that I want to ask you about, but I think one, cause you already mentioned it is 
doing pianos because you've, yeah. you've I, I don't know if you're still playing with them, but but you were I for do. a long time, I do. right? So what it is, in case anyone doesn't know, it's like a concept. Essentially, it's like being in a piano bar where you might have one piano player, but instead there's two and we alternate playing songs and we banter with the audience. In some forms of it, it's sort of like a pre-written script the way I mm -hmm. do it though. Um, it's it's a lot of observational comedy, making fun of people and the songs they're picking, and you know, making a lot of dad jokes. I'm jumping <laughs> on the dad jokes uh, in my show is playing like get to play everything. It's all requests, so it'll be like Disney, Taylor Swift, Aerosmith, Billy Joel, Elton John, um, some rap music. It's all over the place. Yeah, so it's fun. Like you never know. It's it's good for my like my brain to just be throwing random stuff all the time. Yeah, and it's taken me around the world a little bit, which is really cool. Yeah. Please talk about that. Cause I, I, I love, I loved that. Like I, I knew, I knew like I came to, I, I think my, my bachelor party made an appearance at your dueling piano. One of your dueling piano gigs in Manhattan. Oh, and, I kind of remember that. Oh my gosh. I, yeah, I forgot though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, was it, Oh man, what bar was it at? Oh, um, maybe uh, bar nine. Yeah. Bar nine. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, bar nine, and uh, yeah. When you, you, when was that? How long ago? That so I got uh, that was May of 2015. May okay. of 2015. Yeah, almost 10 years ago. It's crazy. Wow! Uh, wow! Wow! And yeah, I, that I place remember, is still going. Uh, I'm not it, there as much, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so cool seeing you do it, though. Uh, seeing seeing how that 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 whole dynamic works, and and it is just you know a gig like that. I think you know, at least for, for any of the listeners is what's so cool about it is what you described about how like you guys can literally play anything, you know, and it's so much of it is requests. Um, and you have to know, like, like, can you talk about that? Like, what is that like prep for that? Or how did you prep or? So, uh, there's like two ways you can go about being good at that gig. And for me, basically I was already doing that. I, I have a pretty good ear. And any songs that I really like that um, I remember from childhood, from the radio, especially if they were on repeat a little bit, I kind of, not necessarily the lyrics, but like uh, the arrangements that, you know, I can sort of make the piano sound like a full band, you know, bass and like yeah. guitar and almost like a snare drum. That's kind of the, the point too, to like a good solo pianist or someone who can sort of cover um, different styles, like to be able to make your piano sound like a band. Uh, yeah. So I had I'd already been doing that. I had just was obsessed with um, with Billy Joel and Elton John and the Beatles, stuff like that. Uh, since I was like in middle school, even beyond before that. So for me, I kind of already had a lot of the skills. I also um, I had a drum kit in my house during middle school uh, or no, during high school. And I would just obsessively play along with like really cool and difficult Stevie Wonder songs. Yeah, that are you know, which I think you. Oh yeah, we used to jam on some of that too. I feel like absolutely, uh, you know, like yeah. Songs in the key of life, like all those songs, oh, really funky amazing. stuff. And so I just kind of had all these skills building up. And to be honest, a lot of it was because I was an only child, and my uh, parents were not around all the time uh, because of work and whatever. And I was really like sad and bored, and also like closeted for the longest time. And yeah, that's all I did to focus, um, you know, to like make, do something positive with my time was play music, which yeah. to be honest, late, later on the last like decade, I've played even less. I mean, I just do it professionally and less at home. And I've been trying to right. find the spark, the spark to help me enjoy music. And yeah. for me, that, that was getting like a B3 over the pandemic and, um, had oh. a B3 and just trying to, you know, cause I, I had space. I was living in new Orleans and I'm definitely taking a left turn here, but um, it is, I don't, I don't know. I'm wondering for you too, is it hard to keep a spark going to enjoy music or do you still really love what you do? Yeah. Oh man. I mean, that's, I think there, the, uh, for me, there's been like peaks and valleys, you know, it's like some, sometimes everything's clicking and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm feeling inspired in like in my personal playing or, or practice time or whatever. Um, but then there's other times and, and also inspired in like the professional side of being a musician. And then there are times where, you know, life is, it's a reality. Like you just, you have to, you 
have to work, you have bills to pay, you have, you know, demands. Right. And it's easy. It, there's been many times of, for me where it's been easy to just be in that grind and not to be able to play as much or, or I just get wrapped up in that. And I start to realize, you know, maybe weeks or months go by and I'm like, man, I, I really didn't, I really haven't done much for myself with music, right. you know? Um, you know, right, right now I, I feel like I, I've felt in a good place for a little while right now, which I'm super great, super grateful for. And trying to find that like person, like, even if it's just practice time for me, like, like just being like, I, I want to work on something on the drums. That's just maybe doesn't apply to like whatever I'm doing professionally with music, but like, it'll, it just brings me joy, you know, trying to carve out time for that. Um, you know, my students are always, they're probably like, yeah, okay, Nick, enough. Let's, let's act talk. Uh, we, we've heard you say no, this I'm, a million times, but, but I, I, you know, well, they've heard me say the it, same you know? stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, there you go. Like we can relate on all this stuff. Cause I kind of missed the hustle a little bit. Uh, yeah. that was cause at the same time when I was hustling, I was meeting a lot of different musicians and playing all different styles, playing different instruments, depending on the gig and going to all different places. I'm mean, usually locally. But it was exciting. It was more, you know, it was exciting for a while. I guess it kind of like becomes more like work eventually. Sure. And uh, yeah, especially when you don't have to do it as much. It's, um, I don't know, definitely the joy can be taken out of it. Like you have to, like you said, like find other in inspiration or and find time for yourself. And for me, that'll often be uh, like sending my songs, uh, sending my favorite songs from like the 60s, these kind of lesser known stuff that no one would play anymore stuff that doesn't get sent to me like by request and just yeah. like i'll send my friends that like that stuff but maybe don't know as much about it all of my favorite songs from my childhood which are really from like my parents childhood right and right i'm like upset or i have a friend that i'm getting into billy joel right now like i've known his whole catalog for like you know 20 years but he's yep. first getting into it and for me I guess that's kind of like teaching probably. I don't do it much anymore, but you get to see like that spark grow in someone else and, um, you know, sh like a sharing experience, uh, sharing your favorite music and like relating on this other level. And yeah. I know, it's exciting. Oh, I, I completely relate to you on that. Like, yeah, it's, that is one of the things I love about teaching is, is getting, getting, showing someone who's never heard of artists, whatever, and being like, hey, you should check this artist out, you know, or you right. should check this, you know, for me, a lot of times you got to listen to this drummer, you know, like, right. you know, even, even if you don't like the style, like just listen to what they're doing on the drums. And, uh, you know, and that, that can, there's been so many times over the years where I realized I, I wasn't listening to music for fun. Like it was, you get it, like, like we were saying, you can right. get into the grind of just work. But then you have that, for me, I have that one student where there was that moment of like, oh, you know what? I should, I should tell them about, you know, right. what, whatever, Prince, you know, you know, I love Prince. Sure. Oh, I, I, you love Prince. About I Prince. wish that I had, I didn't appreciate him at the time when you were telling me you went to his show and everything. And you oh. said, oh, you said like, wasn't Larry Graham there on bass? Yeah. Larry Graham played bass. Yeah. That, that okay. was the, yeah. Well, now you have Larry Graham, Larry Graham. Well, I'm not <laughs> obsessed with Larry Graham, but I'm obsessed with, um, with, uh, or, or, the his the first band he was in um, Sly and the Family Stone Sly and the Family Stone yeah I've been listening to them yeah. like on repeat recently just amazing just the best yeah I watched yeah. Uh, there's a documentary about him or I don't know if that's out yet but I read his autobiography um and Sly Sly and the Family Stone just incredible stuff like uh everyday people is like the best song of all time and it's just oh, got one yeah. basically one chord and Larry Graham just playing boom 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 oh. boom 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 and um, just, I don't know. I love Sly, Sly and the Family Stone. Everybody should like put this on pause and go listen. Yeah, to Sly exactly. And the Stone. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, we're gonna. I'm gonna have to edit in a little like pause here, please. <laughs> you know, yeah, commercial yeah, yeah. break. Uh, yeah, seriously. If you haven't listened to Sly and the Family Stone, you have to. And for all you drummers listening, you need to listen to Larry Graham's bass playing and the way that right, the way that the bait, the rhythm section is remarkable in that band yeah. too like it's just uh and if and if you've never heard him play with uh with prince you should go check that out too uh, honestly but, i need to do you need to give me some recommendations uh, later i yeah. will oh i absolutely um yeah that was that was a whole that was so cool they ended up playing together for a really long time i think they 
I think I remember reading that they they met in the '90s at some point, and then and Larry Graham kind of took him under his wing for like spiritual like guidance and things like that. And, Interesting. But then but then they ended up uh, they ended up just playing like he joined Prince's bands and he would like kind of float in and out of being in his touring band and then and then doing his own thing and but I was I was lucky enough to that was the touring band was was he like Larry was playing with Prince that whole tour and that that was that was crazy that's and John, I didn't appreciate John, that at the time yeah 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 it's I uh John Blackwell was playing drums uh in Prince's band which was he he was amazing um but uh yeah okay that is that's that is awesome i so you were in um you mentioned you were in new orleans for for you were in new orleans for a few years right about five or six years yeah 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 and what was uh how's the music scene there i've never been so uh it, it's um the music itself is amazing uh yeah. it's i will say it's interesting depending who you are if you're like a younger person these days who's not a musician like one of my close friends is not a musician he doesn't know anything about traditional music from new orleans which is kind of wow. sad to me even though yeah. it's kind of all around you and right it, it was for me it was great to like finally um take in what i already knew existed like i used to work not work i in a uh, university i went to stony brook and mm -hmm. my professor was named ray anderson and he had done i think an album with dr john and wow um, he would teach us all these uh, these tunes that uh, like Bourbon Street Parade is one. Yeah, um, people can go check out. And it's these like horn tunes from the the second line bands down in New Orleans. Yeah. And I already kind of knew some of them. I didn't really put it together that he was just you know lifting them from New Orleans to show us that stuff because it would be a mix of that and like Duke Ellington and whatever. And I didn't, but I really really love that stuff. It's uh, it pretty much all has the same beat, you know. Don't, 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 don't. don't. Yeah. Um, It's sort of the Bo Diddley beat. It's sort of um, like the clave right. from like, you know, from the not from America. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, 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 go. Yeah. So, um, and it is cool to spend time there and really hear all that music around you. A lot of it is based off tourism these days. But okay. I have, uh, I did do like, they have second lines for locals. Uh, they also do that for, it's originally it was, for uh, funerals, but they have weekly second lines that one of my good friends, Joseph, goes to. He's not a musician, but he's obsessed. And um, he's like the whitest guy, but everybody <laughs> like accepts him because it's the group is usually not white. And they know right. him as like being the best dancer in town. And like, oh, literally, I'll go, yeah, we'll, like go places and people are like, oh, you like you, you're always at the second line. He just really gets down. Like, I have so many videos, like maybe I can send you a video to insert so you can see. Yes, please. Uh, and uh, I love going to that because they would have the brass bands, but it's all locals dancing wow. for like, they walk for like a mile or two. Um, and it's just the best experience. That's really cool. Uh, getting to know some of the local traditions that sadly, like I said, other certain sec sectors of the local people don't really participate in people from the suburbs yeah. or whatever. But for me, it was great to, to be surrounded by that. I worked on Bourbon Street for about a year in two different places, playing wow. piano, sometimes solo. And I found myself being kind of one of the only guys that would play more of the traditional stuff. But, you know, it's still cool. And living down there, I had the opportunity, like, for instance, to run into, uh, literally run into the bass player from the Meters uh, named George Porter Jr. And they're so wow. legendary. He's played on a million tracks. Uh, they have their famous song, Sissy Strut, which everyone should yes. go listen to. Yep. And super funky. They toured with the Grateful Dead. And they they kind of helped spread um, New Orleans music around the world, uh, including um, Dr. Shoot, Professor Longhair. Professor Longhair yeah. 
they sort of brought him out of retirement. Um, and he has a couple of like standards that are escape me right now, piano standards. And they, but they brought him out of retirement in like the seventies and, and they're super funky. So yeah, I ran into him in like 2021 oh. and it's crazy. The people that live in new Orleans, like Robert plant from Led Zeppelin lives there. I think he's like my friend. Really? Neighbor. Yeah. What? Um, I didn't know that. Oh my god. Yeah, he gosh. lives there. Ray, Ray Davies from the Kinks used to live there until wow. he actually got he got shot. <laughs> oh. And, and that that's will tell you a, a lot about yeah, that'll tell you a lot about New Orleans without me going into details. It is like the Wild West. And there I would recommend if you're a musician heading to Frenchman Street first. But the truth uh, which is in the French Quarter essentially, mm -hmm. but at kind of at the other end of where the uh the real tourist New Orleans bars are the touristy bars play like Sweet Home Alabama. They play like current hits and it's not that exciting. Um, mm -hmm. But on Frenchman street, you'll find a lot of this like brass band music I'm talking about. It's really That's funky. You might not have heard it before. Uh, yeah. Sometimes they'll do really cool covers with the brass bands, but it's, they're so unique and it's, it's just like, Oh, Oh yeah. I mean, I could go on and on. I, I, this is fantastic. I love it. Um, uh, for instance, wait, important. I'll tell you yeah. one more thing. Like okay. I, you'll, you'll see people jamming on the street and I, I was in, um, city park in new Orleans and actually was one of the first places I played music in new Orleans. I brought a little accordion and we had this like ragtag little band trying to like work for tips at this restaurant there, which is now, um, a satellite location of cafe du monde in city park. Wow. Highly okay. recommend going to check that area out. It's very like swampy and picturesque in the park. Oh. But I ended up seeing this band playing and I recognized some of the locals, but there was this guy in his, I want to say eighties. And he also lives in new Orleans and he was like an original musician with Benny Goodman, uh, the big wow. band clarinet player. Yeah. And yeah. so like, I got to jam with, with that guy randomly, you know, you oh. just meet all these cool people down there and it is a really laid back unique uh, place really really humid and but the storied history um yeah. yeah it's great it sounds so inspiring like like it, a little me. bit yeah i wish i had done more learned more local you know like worked with some local musicians more because a lot of times what i do is a lot of like cover stuff trying to get right. people to sing along is the number one thing and dance along, drink along, clap along. That's what, that's like part of that script I was telling you about. And yeah, yeah. Definitely, you know, you you lose some of the local flavor in those cover band sure. or dueling right. piano spots. But I do recommend everyone go there and check out uh, Pat O'Brien's. is like the first place dueling pianos existed supposedly about 100 years ago. Wow. And then there are other, other piano bars nearby. Uh, but they've lost their luster over the years. So probably head to Frenchman Street if you're in New Orleans. You'll see all the funky stuff. And it's it's great. I love that recommendation. That's awesome. Yeah, se yeah. I mean, I, I'm obsessed with uh, second line drumming. It's just, it's so fun and and funky. And the connection, like you said, to kind of that, um, the, you know, to the clave uh right stuff is just it's it's so cool it's so cool and i think so important um for for yeah, not just drummers but i think for all musicians to kind of know a little bit about that like you know I, I you just start to see how you could see how like music so much of music kind of evolves out of there you right. know like uh to your point preservation hall is is like a historic room in new orleans just off of bourbon street where they play like only traditional um new orleans music which by the way dixieland that term has fallen out of favor a little bit so yeah. if i say traditional jazz or trad jazz it means the same thing it's music based on um like marching bands and mixed mm -hmm. with you know from uh like john philip sousa which is like way back yeah mixed with you know like all these like rootsy elements that uh turned into jazz and also actually based a lot off like jelly roll morton piano right playing and stuff like that um yeah and then turned into these like marching bands or whatever so anyway uh it, i just had the name oh yeah preservation hall who's like carried the torch for 
I think since the sixties or maybe before that. And the room that they play in hasn't changed. And when people come to town, like Robert Plant, he sits in with them. I think like Springsteen sat in with them like recently. So everybody reveres this, you know, this group and it is like rotating musicians. But if you watch some of their larger performances from jazz fest or on the Grammys, they'll support other artists. There's usually this bass player or a uh, sousaphone tuba player with the big hair. And I think his dad started that room. Anyway, I've only been there once and they played a track, a track, a tune that I haven't heard since um, or haven't played in like 20 years. And that is St. Thomas, which is, um, yeah, super common standard. It's sort of an islandy flair. And I think they called it as sort of a joke because they don't really have a set list. But okay. he went on to explain, I think before and after the tune, how it has everything to do with um, tunes like that have everything to do and jazz and music in general with this melting pot in new Orleans where uh, you have, you know, people coming up and down the Mississippi and then you have the Caribbean right there and you mm -hmm. have European influences. And in that particular case, you know, he was explaining how St. Thomas, that tune really like is about the spice trade and just like, um, how lots of you know music and culture whatever made its way to New Orleans. And I thought that was fascinating because I also felt yeah. like he was just at first I thought he was kind of a cop out to call that tune, but okay, <laughs> it was amazing. And it's like the best musicians ever with this this completely different flair from what I would have played um, back in New York. Everybody understands that clave thing, and I just can't explain how exciting it was to hear them play St. Thomas, which again is a song yeah. that. Is, I could, you know, leave, leave or take, take or leave, but it was pretty incredible. And you do have like these amazing musicians from everywhere um, coming to New Orleans and creating these different styles. Even like I think it's called bounce music, which is okay. Big Frida. It's this whole like their own version of like hip hop that's like straight from New wow. Orleans. And uh, she's on Beyonce's albums doing her thing. Oh, and so wow. like it's still New Orleans is still influencing. Um, yeah. you know, music around the world, which is pretty cool. It's yeah. so cool. It's incredible. I love it. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you made mention of, you know, kind of missing the hustle and for some of the young, you know, maybe younger students of mine, uh, can you talk a little bit about just the hustle in general? Like what it, what, what, what was it like? What is it like, or, you know, was it like for you? And, you know, what did you love about it? And maybe what did, did you do not like about it? Uh, sure. So I, I will say everybody like should take time for themselves and not work 30 days in a row, but some people, right. <laughs> some people need to. And then people I work with today that don't need to, they still do. Uh, this mm -hmm. agent that I work for a lot, the one that I met years ago in Patchog, he has like, you know, kids and a, and a wife now, but he's still working like as much as possible, including he books gigs for everyone else. But anyway, make sure to take time for yourself. But I do yeah. remember having great experiences, especially when I played in like little bands and duos and trios before doing pianos or around the time I started where I just like gained all these, you know, all this musical knowledge. The only way you can really get good at playing music is playing with a lot of different musicians, listening to a lot of music lessons only go so far unless you have yep. like the coolest teacher but i have a friend also who's a vocalist and he's only recently started singing in front of people because he's so self-conscious and oh. i i tell him all the time like you have an amazing voice you already have the skill set you have to go out and the basic skill set but you have to go out play with other people to gain confidence just to learn little licks and other styles and whatever. So I do miss those days because nowadays it's usually someone who plays piano that I'm working with. They, they don't um, necessarily know all the, you know, they're not very worldly necessarily. Sometimes they just learn basic piano so that they can sing the songs. Maybe they're a great vocalist, but it's rare that I get to play with someone who really excites me these days in the, in the dueling piano world. And when yeah. I step outside of that, it's a whole other thing. But I, the hustle, um, yeah, so that's what it was for me. It was 
playing, okay, now I'm playing a duo and I'm playing guitar. And that guy, um, you know, wants to play like Grateful Dead music, which by the way is a great band. Everybody should check out their yep. influences are like country, funk, rock. If they do every jazz, they do yeah, everything. If you can embrace the, you know, almost Bob Dylan esque qualities of some of the vocals and stuff like yes. that. Yes. And yes. The, the whole point for me and and like the dead is to like always be spontaneous, doing things a little bit differently. And that's what I liked about the hustle because yeah, like I would do sometimes two or three gigs in one day, one with a band, one with a duo, like laid back acoustic and I'm learning songs that I didn't really know. Um, I just, yeah, I do miss all those, those times, but at the same time, it's a lot of effort for less money, but you have to go through that. You like have to go through that to, you know, become a stronger musician. Yeah. Yeah. I thank you for saying all that. I couldn't have, yeah, couldn't yeah. have said it better. And, and it's, it's good to come from, you know, someone, someone else and someone like your, yourself, who's like really played a bunch. And like you said, you've kind of played all over the world at this point. And it can pay off like big time too. Yeah. For me, I was obsessed, like I said, obsessed with Billy Joel and I did all these gigs and it led to uh, playing at this one place in Port Jefferson and the owner there started hiring Billy Joel's guitar player and his new backup singer, Mike Del Judas from Big wow. Shot. And yes, I, I stopped by once. Um, it wasn't my, my night to play. And the owner introduced me to them. And next thing you know, I did like an hour set with them on stage. And then literally a couple of days later, they hired me to play uh, like a big college campus event. And then we played in a thing called Infinity Hall in Connecticut. I think there's a few locations. And I got to play with Billy Joel's drummer, his guitar player, and they all have stories about how they got there also. And they played Mm -hmm. with, you know, locally and then with smaller artists and bigger artists. And then until they made like the big time. And for me, that was like the most exciting thing, probably the highlight of my life, even though it's been years. And so I also, I think everyone should make big goals for themselves is another like piece of advice I have. Cause yeah. my goal was to work on a cruise ship and then I did it for like seven years and then it's like, all right, what's next. And that's where I'm right. at right now, which is a little bit, you know, always aim for like, always have new goals, aim higher. I'm, I'm working on that myself right now. So. Oh, I love, that's awesome. Um, yeah. I, I actually was going to ask you about uh, the cruise, the cruise gigs. Um, Cause that's a whole, I've never experienced that as a musician myself. And that is just such a cool I mean, it's it's just such an amazing experience. So it sounds like it. So, so yeah. six years you did that for, something, um, seven, wow. seven years seven. around. Seven. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. so. I don't know. Uh, it's definitely hard to be away. I was lucky in that I was never away for more than like a month. Sometimes just okay. a couple of weeks, at max like five six weeks. And with those longer trips, I would usually be visiting like Europe. So that was right. really cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a hard life depending which cruise line you work for. They're always changing the rules on you. And I even had like the last gig I tried to do was about a year ago. And the agent, um, can I, can I call them out? Yeah. Why not? As long as it's okay with you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> R. I'm going to check on this. It starts with an R. Um, it's like RWS. I want to say RSW, RSW, whatever. I wouldn't recommend that company. Uh, okay. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. It's R- RWS. I think RWS. Uh, they provide entertainment to all different cruise ships. And a lot of times what I, what you'll find in the entertainment industry in general is it's about, you know, A, like if it's last minute, filling the role, they don't really care what your talent level is. Or wow. B, it's all about like your looks and less about talent. And Jeez. those are both not great ways to hire people. Yeah. Um, that's not exactly what happened last year, but yeah, I don't know. You always have to stick up for yourself to don't mm-hmm. be afraid to turn, turn work down. If it doesn't pay enough, if you, if you feel like you have the experience already, uh, if it doesn't pay enough, if you're not being treated well, um, for me, I think that's the best way to like keep industry standards of pay and everything at a certain level. Uh, right. So I would also, something I like to discuss. And yeah. along those lines, the cruise ship gig that I did the most didn't change in pay in the whole seven years I worked for them. 
So, wow. but I had a, yeah, I had a great time. In fact, it goes back like five years before that I wasn't with them, but they've, they've never changed the rate essentially for the Jeez. piano players. Yeah. And you'd hear like comedians are making two or three times what you're making. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. So I recommend going into comedy and working on cruise ships. They make, they do really well. <laughs> I literally thought about that because about doing it myself, I knew this comedian who was writing songs. She was kind of a musical comedian. It's not really what I do, but she made like twice as much as I was making, you know? And I'm like, maybe I'm in the wrong end of the <laughs> business. Cause yeah. I haven't, haven't pursued it yet, but yeah, cruise ships are great. I worked for Norwegian cruise lines for like the most time and uh, got to see like all of the Caribbean and probably saw about 20 more countries than I wow. had previously. That's so cool. Them. And the highlights being, I mean, most recently I went to uh, Liverpool, which is really cool for me as a Beatles fan. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I always like said, I'm never going to go to Liverpool. It's out of the way you know, of other cities and that's too touristy. Why would I do that? I was like a little, you know, like fawning over the Beatles while I was there <laughs> and just loving everything about it and walking around miles in the rain, sorry, kilometers in the rain and yeah. uh, had like the best time. But other than that, other highlights would be Russia, which now wow. is, you know, this is before they started um, the war with Ukraine, but yeah, that was like the most interesting thing for me. I was there just for a couple of days, twice, and their economy is totally different. Everything about it is totally different. It's just wow. fascinating. I love seeing the world. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. I even made a friend on the street, and it turned into a cool thing. Um, I saw this guy carrying a guitar. He was on his way to a gig. This is in St. Petersburg, Russia. And I like stopped him because I was by myself, and I just wanted to connect with somebody. It was kind of yeah. dark out. It was cold, rainy. And I was like, hey, I play guitar too. And he ended up inviting me to a master class with um, this American, oh no, sorry, Welsh guitar player. So he, he spoke English uh, like the next week. And I went to this master class and it was sort of finger picking Chet Atkins stuff that wow. everybody was doing. Yeah, Tommy and that guy, I can't, Garrett, his name's Garrett. Uh, if you Google like Garrett finger style guitar, he opens for Tommy Emmanuel a lot, who's like, my favorite wow. uh, finger style guitar player. He's sort of well-known as well as well-known as you yeah. can be for uh, instrumental guitar player. Right. And, but that was fascinating. Like you have to, when you travel, like you have to talk to people, get to yeah. know them. You never know what'll happen. Yeah. That's so cool. And and yeah. that's, you know, like it's awesome because it's all through that, that gig, that experience on that cruise gig, you know, right. it's like an opportunity, like you were saying, like even with the hustle kind of thing, like, right. you know, Sometimes and taking those chances. The last cruise gig I did, I was just so lucky. I got recommended to it from a friend of mine who I met during the pandemic. She was uh, promoting this online channel where she would get you a bunch of people watching you. They'd tip you. You'd play for like an hour. And it was called Quarantine Keys. Oh, that's that kind cool. of faded away. Yeah, it faded okay. away. But I went to visit her that summer. I, I couldn't mm -hmm. sit still and I wasn't working. Ended up in Colorado playing at piano bars there. And um, I road trip wow. up to Seattle. Yeah, up to Seattle from there. I saw a whole bunch of states I'd never been to, including with with my little dog. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he made it up to uh, Seattle and Portland. And we, we lived in Colorado for like a month. That's amazing. And through her, her name is Jamie McNeil. She's in Denver. And there's a lot of great piano spots in Denver, actually. She needed a partner to work on uh, Disney Cruise Lines. This is oh. a couple of years ago already. And she thought of me because we had to potentially share a room. And she said, I wouldn't mind sharing a room with you. And my other cruise gigs, you always got your own space. Usually it was okay. a below deck sort of, but I would have a porthole and I'd have my own bathroom and like a desk and a couch. And that is not the case for most entertainers on the cruise ships though. They, oh, wow. We had a certain contract where they had three rooms provided to us on the four ships we were on. And they're called officer's cabins. So basically, you know, the cruise director and anyone pretty high up have like the same kind of cabin. But uh -huh. it's not like that for everyone else. This is a tangent, but it's kind of good to know. It's, uh, it's you know, it's four to six month contracts. 
and you're sharing a very, very small room and maybe there's a bathroom in between called a Jack and Jill. And that bathroom is shared between four people essentially. And it's, it's a different kind of life, no windows. Uh, But the Disney cruise though, turned out to be, I did get my own cabin. It was a, uh, a real state room with a huge window. And I, I saw Orcas like free Willy, you know, jump in outside the window, (laughs) like could not have been cooler. I had the best weather. I did it two years in a row. I, kind of forgot that i'm a disney adult and then like it re reopened that part of me yeah that's so cool year, oh and jamie got sick she didn't make it the first year so i was still there by myself another friend came in to help but i i felt so lucky and so sad because she got covid she couldn't even come on the cruise oh. i did it without her even though oh. she got me the recommendation and then i did come back the next year which was my last year doing it just be, you know i just they, you know, they recast it and stuff, but right. I had the best time and I was able to bring Jamie came and I was able to bring awesome. two different friends on wow. uh, for two different cruises and we just had the most fun. Yeah. I can't even That's explain. Awesome. I highly recommend um, actually working for Disney cruise lines. Everyone seemed pretty happy. The crew seemed pretty yeah, happy awesome. more so than Norwegian. Uh, yeah. Highly recommend that as a vacation or, you know, as for working, Disney was like the best. That's yeah. so cool. That's and good that to hear. Gig, yeah, for me, that gig was only three days a week for 90 minutes, uh, which wow. was, a, yeah, versus, let's see, we did, uh, I was on stage for like two and a half hours a night, four nights a week with the Norwegian one. Oh, wow. And, That's a big difference. But that two and a half hours, I was splitting vocals and everything with someone else. It's like four okay. hours, but you're on for two and a half to three because you rotate. But yeah. that compared with all the other singing pianists, sometimes you have to do six to seven nights a week, three to five hours by yourself. And so wow. that's a gig that I never felt was for me yeah. because it's it's not good for your vocal health and stuff. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say. But I, I missed the Disney gig. That was the highlight. Yeah. It was in Alaska both times. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to com- like to even decide if I would do that again or do like a European run. I kind of miss yeah. the Caribbean as well. That whole life was really fascinating. Uh, it's up and down though. You, it's a lot of loneliness and yeah, you know, r- rules from right. the cruise line sometimes. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I can imagine that kind of being a seesaw at times, like right. With, you know, going between just like something so fun and then and then feeling a little bit lonely because of how you know, where you are being out at sea and, you know, away, away from just your quote unquote normal life, you know? Right. Exactly. Uh, And it like, it really prevented me a bit from having any kind of normal life. And then I got the dog and it was, yeah, you know, it's hard to find people to like watch him. I'd be like, yeah, I need to go away for like three weeks. Can someone watch my dog? And so it's been a sort of conscious decision to not travel like that anymore for now. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, man, it's 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 th- this is all I I love all of this though. It's uh, you know the the different facet facets of like your life as a musician, even just in this short time, is like amazing to me. It's I, so. Cool. I have a question for you. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm living in Astoria, Queens now, like outside of Manhattan. And oh yeah, just yes, yeah, just yesterday, I ran into someone who I worked with on the cruise ship. Okay. Um, going back like seven years ago. And I just thought that was so cool. Like I'm constantly running into people. Do you run into people in New York at all? Um, Whether it's I mean, friends, just, family, coworkers. Or... Yeah. Uh, um, I'm putting like you on really the spot. Just, yeah, really <laughs> run into them on the street though. I like, I no, not, I mean, not, well, I guess maybe, but like nobody, um, just like people in like the neighborhood that maybe I haven't seen in a while. Like it's weird. Okay. Like you could go through that. I'm in uh Regal park still. Right. And like, I, it, I could like go like my wife or I could go like weeks without seeing like someone or, or a long right. time, you know, and then be like, and then all of a sudden randomly like bump into them again. But as far as like, um, you know, never, re- I never really run into like, family or friends that like i i 
if I see them like regularly, you know, like, um, I don't know. Well, there is a, a bit of a point to this, which is, yeah, I guess it's good not to burn bridges. It's good to, you never know who you're going to see yesterday. Like I said, I ran into an actor. Oh, that's great. On shit. And then right. about a month ago, I ran into uh, this girl, Tara, that I went to summer camp with. And we used to like work together in musicals at the summer camp. I played music with her brother and I don't yeah. know. I love how small the world is sometimes. Yes. No, 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 you're right. Yeah, no. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, it is, it is good to try to not burn b bridges and, uh, um, That's a hard yeah, one for never, me. <laughs> Oh yeah. No, for, for me, for, I think for everybody, honestly, for me, for sure. Um, uh, but yeah, no, that's really good advice. That's really good advice. Um, yeah, because you just never know. And like everybody, you know, we're, we're always growing as people, right? Uh, and especially like in, you know, like in the world of like being a musician, it's like like everything you've been talking about, the amount of musicians, different, different people you've worked with, you know, uh, over the course it's, of your life. It's like- It's wild. Like just in the dueling piano world, some people that I'm, you know, close with will have 300 mutual friends. Mm. Like that's pretty insane. I never really think about it, but yeah, our group, insane. <laughs> it's insane. We have about 1,200 people in our dueling piano network, mostly in North wow. America. But I mean, honestly, I have a friend from um, who's Dutch. Well, he's British, <laughs> but lives in uh, near outside of Amsterdam. They're from all over the world. Um, and somehow I, I have like, yeah, 300 and something mutual friends. I guess, I guess I've made some connections over the years. Like I never really <laughs> Maybe. think about it, but yeah. that's pretty wild. Yeah. I, that's more people than I went to high school with. So I wouldn't, you know, and I probably barely have any, you know, connections to them anymore. So yeah. it's just, I don't know. It's wild. Like the entertainment world can be kind of small. And yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's also easy to, create a great reputation or a mediocre reputation for yourself based on right. a number of factors. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's maybe that, that's a really good thing to maybe talk about for a second is like, yeah, like it, it, it can, it, it can be easy to do any of that, right. To create a great reputation, like you said, a mediocre or even a poor one, you know, right. like, you know, it's, it's, it, it's crazy how quickly that can spread around, you know? Um, I remember like even just, you know, in some of the, the projects we worked on just being in, being in and out of a studio and like you see other people come in and out that are unrelated to like the sessions we were working on, but like right. you'll see like engineers or producers talk to each other briefly about what they're doing in other spots. And, and like, they're all connected. You're hearing like, Oh yeah, I got so-and-so coming in to do this thing. Yeah. yeah you like my hand signals. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it hasn't ended. I still talk with my hands, but uh, uh, you know, th like they, like it, it just stood out to me even all the way back then. How, yeah. Like how small the, the music community can be is like, right. how, and, and how, you know, how maybe we we might behave like it, it's normal to have a bad day or a bad night, you know, but it's so right. interesting how like that could, that one instance could compound. And then like years later, like you, like in this case, like I remember situations where I heard like producers talking about unrelated, I get, I'm just a fly on the wall in that situation. Right. They're like, Oh, who are you recording with? Oh, I'm recording. Oh gosh. Yeah. Good luck with that. You know, it's like, that, yeah. And, and it's, it's like, uh, and I remember just being like, wow, like that's, that's, that's wild. You know, it doesn't take in, much. In my piano world. Well, I have some friends that are also in the wedding band scene, which I used to do as well. And yeah. 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 Like everybody talks shit about everybody and you have to really watch <laughs> There's this, so a really close friend of mine is, you know, works with this uh, keyboard player and uh, this other like very close friend of mine who I don't know as long, but he's like more of a colleague told me all these stories about my friend's friend. Like, don't ever work with him. He doesn't pay. Oh. And I'm like, oh my God. So I'll, I'll relay that story, you know, to my friend. And he's like, yeah, I've heard, I've heard not everybody likes him, but I'm like, that's not what I heard. Like there's so much drama sometimes. Um, yeah. But I think the people that, that bring less drama and bring all the skills, they, they, you know, they do the best out there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah.
Um, oh, it's, it's such a good point. Um, that, you're I one think, of those people, like you're, you're like just a really nice person. You, you uh, know, never upset thanks, anyone man. and you like, you would really study and just, you know, you knew what you were doing. Oh, I, you. you know, I loved working with you. And I didn't notice it until later on, like, wow, this is actually like, we've had, we had a long working relationship and yeah, excuse me. I didn't, it wasn't until later. I was like, wow, we've done all these different things together, made yeah. two records uh, yep. and tried to do some other for years. And I didn't take it so seriously in the beginning, but looking back on it, it's like, we did some really cool stuff. <laughs> we did. I, I totally yeah. agree with you, man. Yeah. And by the way, I, I re really appreciate all, all that. Uh, and, you know, likewise, like it was, it's always a joy working with you and playing, playing music with you is just so fun. Um, yeah. I, I want to say like, maybe we could talk about that. Like making those two records was, was just a, an amazing experience. Um, it was. In a way, and they're also in both a, very different. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And but what's so interesting is, yeah, they are so very different. But or, or it, I should say the pr the process for making them was very different. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, That's yeah. What I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Because I was gonna say it's so it's so interesting to me looking back on that th those two time periods and it and like because a lot of the same musicians were involved, you know, g give or take a few, you know. Right. But uh, you know, so so at face value, you might say like, well, it's like it's almost like a thought like the first it's like a first record and a follow up record, you know. But in a lot of ways, like because the process was so totally different, you know, from right. our, the first record we worked on together and the second one, it's really cool. It's like two, two totally memorable and unique experiences. For um, sure. I probably enjoyed the creative aspect of the second one more because, yeah, <laughs> but, but also, I mean, I look, but that first record, I'm, I've only recorded so many you know, EPs and things with people and like the, a lot of it's been with you. And I have to say though, I'll, I'm so proud to like show both of those records Me to too. people. Some of the other stuff I've done is maybe too like rootsy or country for like some of my friends where they are more like a hip hop person, which I'm right. really not, but I just had so much fun on both but of those records. But you crushed it on both of those they're records. Both, like, I had a hard time. Uh, with the first one because I'm not like a reading based musician and uh, right. all the, but it was kind of fascinating. And it reminds that record reminds me more of like how Steely Dan would probably work. That's because, very interesting. You say that. Yeah. Yeah. Like just you and Dan would be, um, and what was Dan? Did, who's, has Dan been on or like you talked to Dan? What's Dan has been on. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. What's, uh, we, what's his last name again? Asaro. Asaro. Right, right, right. Oh, and funny story, my mom used to work with his dad like two decades no before way. that. Yeah, I don't know if you knew what? that. No, I didn't Jerry. know that. Yeah, his dad's name's Jerry, wow. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah wow. Yeah, yeah they wow. worked at Swiss Air together in like the IT department. Okay, yeah. so so to really connect to your point from a few minutes ago, like, right, wow, right. it is a small world. <laughs> it is, <laughs> like, it is. That's, um, that's Long Island, and Long Island is actually has millions of people. <laughs> But, yeah, right. Exactly. You know, yeah. we just kind of came together. And so it is a really small world sometimes. Yeah. It's super yeah. strange. And uh, I really, I really like, I really like, yeah, that's a really interesting, I feel like that it probably was, was, would, would be similar to how Steely Dan would have, would have worked. And, and right, I, I, I want to give a lot of a shout out sure. to Dan here because like on that record, because he really was like so meticulous in, the songs and being prepared and you know and and like i remember even for me like seeing him chart out the the songs for like for you and and for himself even like it made me say well okay i gotta go in and i remember charting out the songs for myself like i had my own charts in the studio even though i was like writing these songs but right it, it was a it was like a different uh it was it was a very very detail oriented like process which you know for some people that might be very very stressful and then i don't know it, it i don't know if it was sh if stress is the right word but like i felt very just very focused on details you know what i mean and yeah. like and the second record was was not quite like that 
No. And we didn't have Dan. But I have to say, maybe it's, you know, a lot has to do with the producer, Gabe, who really held everything together both times. I know a girl for every 22. Every time I see her, it's like deja vu. Baby girl, I swear I dream of you. But not every dream comes true. Breadwinner, so I lose sleep. Counting money instead of counting sheep. Insomniac, but I got big dreams. Rule your reality. Damn, I can't lie. And it's you, you know, of course, like laying down the foundation, but it totally, we had a completely different process. I mean, I guess in the beginning it was similar. We came, well, I think I had more of a hand in coming up with some of the ideas because we jammed in a Big studio time. and stuff. And then I don't know, next thing you know, you're like, Hey, here's the tune. Like based on what we worked, what we jammed, I had, I was like, okay. I didn't even realize that we were accomplishing anything. Um, uh, but I, it was nerve wracking for the first album because like you said, it was you and Dan and the Steely Dan thing really does kind of fit. You were sort of partners and the songs were great, but they were very like structured before we got into the studio. And the right. second one was like sort of that, but then, you know, I like, you gave me lots of freedom. It was so fun. I remember I played um, like on like an old Wurlitzer, oh, which yeah. now I have one. Yeah. Do and, you? Oh, that's so yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I got it when I got to New York, um, like oh. the 70s. Mine's kind of cool. It used to be, if you look up Wurlitzer 206A or 206, it was actually in um in a studio in, in a college in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And they would have like six of these and like one, a seventh one that every uh, keyboard would plug into. But it's electromechanical, meaning like you hit a note and it's not plugged in to the electricity. You can hear the faint you know it's like it's hitting like wow. a weed kind of oh, like a fender awesome. roads and they would have like a whole studio of these at universities so which i did also in stony brook but it was electronic keyboards and the right. teacher could mute like mute all of the other <sighs> students while you played for the class and it's it's one of those it's pretty cool that's but the really bones cool. of it is like a vintage Wurlitzer. And yeah. Shooting for the stars, empty the clip, reload again. One if for killing the game, I fit the description. We popping pills, never needed a prescription. She can't tell if it's love or addiction, but knows in this position, I hit her spot with precision. Cause baby, I can see your beauty from a mile away. Stay up one night like a Saturday. She gets on her knees like it's Sunday. Now she wanna spend time and a half like a holiday. I'll take you to the promised land, you can follow me. I hate Instagram, baby girl, that's a hollow me. But anyway, back to, to Gabe's studio. Yeah, uh, different process, but like the records came out great. I remember I ended up playing acoustic guitar too. And we just, did, yeah, I really oh, love that vibe. Yeah, yeah. That and that that was like, wasn't that uh no, not Steely Dan. I remember what was our what was the inspiration there? There like that was on the track Beat Light. Uh okay. on the on the eighth and I remember that was okay. That yeah. I remember we were very the the, the similarity to the to the Lo the Love Pocket album to me was like we were we were very prepared going in. Like we knew like okay, we're doing the these these X number of songs, and like right. this is the vibe. You know, we had demos and all that stuff, and I remember working with Abe and like being like, you know, like showing him the the stuff, and he was like, great. Like he knew, like he instantly was inspired to like get with us, you know. Right. But I remember, I remember those those just the first day we were together on the first day, like we did uh, uh like the whole rhythm section. But... Yeah, sure, yeah. Sure. The, the the first. Uh, the first two days were like me and you uh, we, and, and cause he wanted to track the rhythm section pretty much together. You know um, we were almost going to do it actually live. Uh, but then I think we ended up doing it track by track where like I recorded and then you laid over, but, but it was, we were together the whole, the whole time, which was so cool right. because, but, but I remember, wow, I'm, I got sidetracked. I remember we go in there and it was almost like, I remember feeling like, okay, let's throw that all out the window. And like, let's like, like we know the strong songs, but like, let's just see what happens, you know? And, right. and, and like you said, maybe that's his kind of guidance as a producer, the way he's so like, I love him so much. And he's, 
his, his approach is so gentle, you know, it's like, like just, just kind of, it just brings out like whatever the vibe is calling to be, you know, and cause, cause the, the, what we ended up with to me was just so much better than what I thought it could be, you know, yeah. going into it. I uh, and agree the, with everything. Guitar part, the, the acoustic guitar part, I remember that was later because like we, we were tracking guitars at that point and you know, the, um, uh, I remember you were inspired in the moment on that. Like we didn't have, that wasn't, that part right. like wasn't planned out. And I remember we were, it was, it's, I have such this vivid memory of like, I remember standing in the control room and you were sitting on the couch and, you know, Corey was tracking guitar. He had, it was doing like electric guitar on that part. And then they, and then him and Abe were kind of talking about like that something's missing. We need something else. And I remember you just, you just like, my memory of this is you just like stood up and was like, I, I got it. And, and like, he, he had guitars <laughs> on the wall. He had like yeah. guitars on the wall. And there was an acoustic, I think it was a 12 string. I was going to say it was a 12 string. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you yeah. just grabbed that. And in the moment, like you were in the control room and you were like, I'm thinking of doing this. And it was like, okay, great. Go like get in there. And he mics you up. And then it was like one take. All the signs that you know You're getting caught up in rhythm and life But I don't think about it, baby The feelings push your groove All thoughts turn to rhythm and life Yeah, like, sounds about just, right. <laughs> yeah, it was so yeah, great. Yeah. But it makes the, like, I remember as soon as I, I was like watching you through the window, and as soon as I heard you play that, I'm like, oh, this is because that was the chorus of the song. And I remember it just it gives that core. It just fills it out. You know, I, the, the, the point like, I, you know, w one thing to take away for anybody listening is like how much fun it is to make a record and how amazing the experience can be when you're playing with people that you're really th there's musical chemistry there. And, and you're also you feel safe in allowing everybody to take risks you know to to, to voice their their I inspiration in the moment and um you you just get something really special i i think that 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 our second album together that there's just so much there's so much love in that in every track you right. know i think you know like we really hear this care for every song um and not that you don't hear that in the first album. I, I think you do, but yeah, just the, the experience on that second one was so fun. Like every day, I remember they had an old piano in, in the, in the lobby and we would right. have lunch. And I remember one day you, like we just sat down, you just sat down one day and started playing. I care about, I have a video of you. I should splice oh. that in of you oh my playing. Gosh. You were, you were playing something. Uh, I'll send it to you, and, and if you're okay with it, I'll splice it into oh, this. But I'm sure. Uh, I'm, yeah, it, yeah. It, I was eating some stupid sandwich, and you just was you just like <laughs> sat down. It was just like, and you're just like jamming to something, and maybe even singing, even. But uh. that's the like. I'm telling that story just because like that whole experience, like what it was just so fun like that, you know, it was like, right. well, let's try this, let's try that, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I remember, yeah, you did so much on that album. You did so much bass keys and, and guitar. We definitely all, like, we, there's definitely a couple clap tracks in there of like all of us in the live room, like clapping yeah, along yeah. or something. Um, yeah, but uh, anything, any, any, I don't know, any, I've just been blabbering away. So is there anything you wanted to say about? No, not really. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's, so the two records, like I, we were saying, like they were put together pretty differently, but I really like them both. Uh, they have yeah. a lot of the same elements mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm kind of happy that I had like two different experiences with that. And yeah. it, it was, yeah. I mean, there's both stressful to make in different ways. Right. But they're 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 fun records yeah yeah
Yeah. So if, if people, if you haven't heard it, you should definitely check it out. I'll, uh, I'll put a link in the description <laughs> cool. uh, to go check those out. But yeah, it, it was so fun. And, um, it was very collaborative in a way though. Uh, we had, yeah. you know, like, pro I mean, sort of three different vocalists, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of that kind of came in last minute. I feel yeah. like, well, um, yeah. but it, but it honestly kind of works in the end, you know, I really, I think so can listen to those records like i don't really listen to any records in full and i like those so oh man that's so something cool. yeah i'm like i have a a playlist on spotify of like stuff that i've recorded it's not that much stuff two of the records are on there and then there's some other things and they're like the the two things that i send people to first because they're just wow. fun and uh this like very varying like you know styles and yeah. influences on it and very, I don't know, you could like kind of dance to it. I don't have, you know, a lot of recordings I've done that you can like groove to and dance and, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, I, and, and that, and that was definitely, I think, our hope, right? When we were making those was like to achieve something like that, you know, to at least give, g give that kind of vibe. Um, just as a, I want to, I want to shout you out for a second. I'm just remembering that's the, the Ace Nation album. Uh, you have the one of my all time favorite keyboard solos on uh, when you take that keyboard solo and let it grow. The and you just played that on the spot. That wasn't like play like again. It's what I it's just such a cool experience was like we that whole structure of that song. We had a totally different. We had like the chord progression and the, the drum groove and the bass line. But I remember. It, the whole like the, the the intro the way the guitar like there's like that little guitar lead thing in the beginning that wasn't a part of it that was a studio you know working with a great producer that was that experience right. but but even the solo like your keyboard solo just came it was like oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna do this and you were like okay cool and uh you just sat down and just played this um I, your opening lick on that i just is so good um i just love it the best, uh, the best solos and the best music is made without any plans at all. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, I use this John Lennon quote, like, all the time. And it's not usually in the, I don't apply it to things like this usually, but life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Yeah. I, I feel like that's kind of true in the studio, too. I've had other experiences also where, like, I played a guitar solo one take and it wasn't quite perfect but the vibe was just so amazing that the producer was like we're gonna leave it as is not gonna uh, edit it or punch in yeah um and it's funny uh do you know chapel rowan yeah something she, like. she's like a really big artist right now and okay. she has this song called pink pony club okay and her stuff is like very produced uh to be like you know pop tracks and radio right. ready but there's the guitar solo in that song, Pink Pony Club. And when they um, they do this uh, run of scales, and right after that, there's these bends. One of them is so out of tune. I noticed oh. it recently. Yeah, it has like 300 million plays on Spotify. And <laughs> the guitar solo is out of tune. And so, and I think it's the same producer for Olivia Rodrigo. Oh, and wow. Okay. I feel like they probably could have caught that, but maybe they just left it in because it's so natural. And yeah. that's my point. Yeah. yeah but everyone yeah. should go listen to that. It's like 27 seconds before the song ends. The guitar player is like kind of flat on one of the bends. And wow. But I guess like even on like a major pop record, sometimes it's good to just go for it and leave right. the, you know, roughness in. And yeah, yeah, like a human element, and and like yeah. you said, if it, if the vibe is there, maybe the vibes what's key, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes it is. Some sometimes you get something, you can get a performance that on paper is like so technically perfect or whatever, but the the feel isn't there or the the, the energy is not there, you know. And then other time, like other times, you could have a quote unquote like kind of sloppy performance, but if like the vibe and energy is there and it matches the song, that's perfect, you know. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it harkens back to, like, 
the majority of time that people have been making records or like maybe half the time now where there was no click track like right in the 50s and 60s there was no click track yeah. and but like that's some of the best stuff and there also weren't like electronic tuners yep and i was just listening to um grateful dead live and they're they're tuning their guitars and bob weir goes ah, it's good enough for rock and roll and he goes into <laughs> the song and they were playing for like twenty thousand people and yeah you know it was being recorded and i just love that like raw energy um me too that you get you know and it's not really the same anymore these days right. I, there's like you can tune your gu guitar on your you know your phone you can punch in on records you can quant was it quantize quantize like, yeah beats yep. and stuff and it takes the like you said the human element out of it and not yeah. as much my thing yeah but no i mean some of that we did on i like, guess a mixture you know of stuff yeah. i'm sure you, you did a lot of that gabe did a lot of that on the both records but that human element which is what i really appreciated about the second record yeah me too oh yeah, yeah. yes and, it, and and it is that like fine line you know, because, because yeah, I, we definitely did our fair share of like production-y type stuff in the studio, you know, but yeah, it, I remember him saying that when I met with him in prep for uh, the second record, I remember playing him the demos and he was like, I, rem I remember him saying like, I'd, re I'd really love to capture like the band element of this, like a band, like I'd love to capture this live feel. Right. And he, cause he, he even felt it just from those demos we, you, that we made. Remember you were coming over here, recording right back here, uh, right. like little oh, ideas yeah. Yeah, yeah. here. We did plenty of that. And, uh, and that's how we made those demos. And he, even hearing that he, he, there was a difference for him from the first record we did together where he was like, yeah, I, I, I'm even he was hearing like, as best we can, I want to get this really organic thing, you know, like and, on the first uh, record, that, uh, the only thing that was acoustic were the drums. And I think even yeah. then you you did like a sample for the snare a lot of the time or something. Uh, yeah, we doubled it. We, we had the like the acoustic snares in it, but we would double the, the right. snare with like a sample underneath it in the mix so and yeah like, it was no acoustic guitars no, no um like like acoustic in like pianos type of thing and then the you know we had a Mel though... mellotron on that oh well that's uh, pretty cool okay yeah yeah like a yeah. legit one was it legit it was a legit or... yeah Th at that okay. time uh it was uh at that time the like second guy that was that was like in the studio that like ran the studio with him uh had one i think he he played in wilco if i remember correctly um what, but what's he dan had, up he to i'm uh, not dan i'm dan. sorry well yeah what's dan up to and what's gabe up to these days dan moved to he was in astoria for a very long time actually he was in he was in brooklyn back in the day and then he moved to astoria they, they him and his wife were living in astoria for a while and uh just recently they moved uh, within like the last maybe two years or so i think um uh i i think like just outside of the city um, does gabe still have but, a studio oh yeah yeah he's it's yeah still the same studio uh, same studio i they had like a big renovation where him and his uh his buddy who had like a sec like on that third you know on that floor was like two studios and him and his buddy kind of combined forces and so now it's like the whole floor is like this whole big beautiful studio and um, yeah, it's Transmitter Park Studio in Brooklyn for anybody listening. Check them out. I was going to say, shout them out. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. They're uh, just incredible. Um, you know, uh, so many, so many people have recorded there and I, it's an honor to have, have worked at that's, you know, have played there, uh, and recorded our records there. Um, yeah, he's, he's doing, he's killing it. He's doing great. Still, still in that same spot. And, uh, yeah, um, awesome dude awesome amazing musician amazing producer um an amazing guy just super nice guy oh yeah the mellotron yeah i just wanted to say yeah we that that was like something from his partner and i remember him just being like i was at the studio with him on a particular day and, and we had like a a midi keyboard part that we we wrote and it was on one of the tracks 
And I remember he's like, I don't want that. Like, I don't want this like MIDI sound. Like let's, he's like, you know what? In like two rooms over, there's like this little Mellotron thing. Oh yeah. And he just like brought it over, plugged it in. And that was probably the coolest sound on the whole for me. That's was cool. Like, I don't know if I knew that or remembered that. Yeah. I think it's on uh ghost town. It's that, it's that sound on ghost town. Um, yeah. People go listen to that. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Um man, I feel like uh I feel like we covered so much. Is there is there anything you wanted to talk about that that I didn't talk to you about? No, I think we're okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh man, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Um I feel like it's been over an hour or or close to blast. it and I yeah. I just really appreciate your you taking the time and chatting and um yeah, this was so much fun for me and I really um, you, you, your, your journey as a musician, your story is incredibly inspiring to me. And I know that everybody listening is going to, there's so much fruit for them to take out of this. Um, so thank you oh, so much. Thank you. I changed my Instagram handle today. I don't remember oh. for what I made it. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let, oh, yeah. Me, let me know. Yeah. Uh, feel free to like follow me. Um, and yeah, yes. it's well, been super well, what, fun. What are you, uh, is there anything you want to plug really quick? This episode should be coming out like within the next week and a half or so. So not, not really, but you know, okay. I am looking for like people to collaborate with and stuff like that. Awesome. So, awesome. Yeah. So we're going to have, I'm going to have uh, uh, in like the, the description of this, this uh, podcast episode, I'll have your Instagram handle and all that stuff. Uh, and, uh, and we'll, we'll link to uh, the albums we made together. Um, yeah. Awesome. And, uh, awesome. That's that's going to be um, so cool. So Zach, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you for it. inviting me. This is so fun. I had a great time. Awesome. Awesome. And we'll do it again. Yeah. We'll do it again. I'm yeah. sure we'll have more. to. Let's do more podcasts and let's play, make some music too. One of these things. Yeah. Oh, please. That would be, that would be so much fun. We got to use the Wurlitzer. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, speaking of which, my current favorite song uh, is called Bloody Well Right. And I'm just trying to remember which artist it is. Bloody well, right? It's uh, it's from the '70s. Oh yeah, awesome. Super Tramp. Super oh, Tramp, so good. Yeah, Bloody Well, right? Everybody check it out. It's got this amazing Wurlitzer part in the beginning, which is what we talked a little bit about that vintage keyboard. Yeah. And it's it's funky. It sounds like Led Zeppelin a little bit in moments. Um, oh, that's so cool. I love it. Bloody Well, right? Check it out. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you so very much. And we got to do this again and we got to play some music. Yeah, that sounds great. I can't wait to do that. And thanks for having me. Awesome. My pleasure. All right. Have a great day. All right. Cheers. Kiss and the world wishes because you ain't got your t-